This episode of Own the Gray is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses. Welcome to On the Grey, a podcast to dispel the notion that aging is undesirable and setting new positive attitudes. I'm Deborah Jones, and I believe you can be vibrant and healthy throughout the best years of your life. As we age and life throws a curveball, it's easy to question our value and where we fit in. If we're forced to make fundamental changes due to divorce or widowhood, unemployment or health challenges, we can wonder, am I too old to choose this direction? Will I be taken seriously? Can I still chase my dreams? Is it too late to start over? These were the questions that my next guest asked herself when within one year, She became an empty nester, was let go from her job, got divorced, and became bedridden due to the stress. Determined not to give up, Jennifer Arthurton found the courage to start over and become a mindset mentor, podcast host, speaker, and writer who now inspires and supports other women who are navigating midlife. Her business and podcast, entitled Old Chicks No Shit, is what she wants the world to know, that women over 50 can design a life they love and leave an inspirational legacy. She says that the name of her business, Old Chicks No Shit, is a tongue-in-cheek expression to open the door to a serious conversation. She says it's about reminding ourselves that we are so much more than our age, our faces, and our bodies. We are knowledge, experience, and wisdom. We're not the middle-aged women of our mother's and grandmother's time. We are the mavens with wisdom to share. Well, like me, Jennifer is also making waves in this new paradigm-shifting movement to change the way we view aging. So I invited her on to Own the Grey to share her story about how she reinvented her life at 50. I'm your host, Deborah Jones, and here's our conversation. We both made the discovery that once we turn 50, there's very little out there as far as inspiration and guidance as to what our lives can look like other than what society says is we're over the hill, we're good for nothing, and that's the end of our our excitement. So I've listened to some of your podcasts too, and you've been talking about this. And I wonder why did you pick up this topic? What was your inspiration and what is your passion around it? Um, So my inspiration really came from my own story. So in the year leading up to my 50th birthday, I found myself empty nested as my daughter went off to university three hours away. I got divorced. Um, I was let go from my corporate career, like a 30 year (laughs) corporate career and, uh, found myself basically bedridden with a stress related illness that like, for the most part, I, I couldn't function. I couldn't get out of bed. So, you know, it took me a long time of feeling sorry for myself, honestly. Um, but then to realize like, and this whole, I had this whole notion that I had to start over. Like, basically I was like, who's starting over at the age of 50? Everything that I had built and invested myself in was no longer available to me. And I really thought I was starting over. And so, I mean, I've since come to realize I wasn't exactly starting over. We can talk more about that later. But sure. um, in that notion, I started to look for inspiration. Okay, what's possible for women over 50 who are starting from the beginning? Like what's possible? And as I started looking out there, I started to realize that there isn't much, you know, it's, 
everything that you see 50 year old women portrayed is like bladder leakage protection, um, meal replacement shakes or sitting around waiting for their grandkids to visit. And I'm like, none of those feel like they apply to me. Like I still, even though, you know, I was in this place where I honestly thought my life was over. There was still some part of me that said, I have so much more left to do and so much more left to give. And so I was like, okay, but what, what am I going to do? And what am I supposed to give? And so, you know, like I said, as I started searching for this inspiration and realizing that there wasn't much that like really got me inspired, like that psyched me up. Mm. And that's why I decided to start the podcast because I wanted to share other women's stories of, you know, them reinventing themselves at like whatever age that, whether that be 40, 50, 65, 70, just so that other women can know that it's possible because there was a long period where I really thought this is it. This is the end for me. I'm supposed to be riding off into the retirement sunset with, uh, with a man on my arm or on the arm of a man. And here I am, I can't even get out of bed. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah. And so it, it, as I was kind of really soul searching and the other part was like having had all of my external roles um, removed from me, it made me realize that I had really no clue who I was, right? Like I was before that, I was a mom, I was a corporate executive, you know, I was a gym rat, like I was all these things. And when none of those applied to me anymore, I had no idea who I was. And so um, a lot of what I talk about now came from a lot of deep search, soul searching on my part. And that I'm seeing is very common in a lot for most women who kind of reach this point. Yeah. I, and so I, I went into podcasting for the same reason as the research for, mm-hmm. for what is possible. Exactly. So I totally get that. And in your podcast, has there been anything that surprised you or any kind of patterns that you see that a lot of people are mm-hmm. talking about? Like, what are we dealing with? Yeah. Um, the thing that surprised me actually was the fact that there is a very common pattern with women who, you know, kind of reach this place in their life where they're like, whatever I was doing before, whether it was as a result of a crisis moment like mine, or like, or, you know, for some women, it's an illness or whatever that is, there was this realization that I don't know myself, I don't know what I want. And a lot of that has come from us as women notoriously putting ourselves on the back burner, right? Like we do for everybody else in our lives, our kids, our families, our jobs, Right. And we are always last. And of course, you know, when you're last, nobody ever gets to the bottom of their list, (laughs) first of all. Right. Um, And so a lot, just like I had, most women had just become completely disconnected from who they are, like completely disconnected from their own dreams and desires. Like even, you know, like what's important to them on a day to day basis. And like I see it now in the women that I interview, I see it now in the workshops that I do and with the clients that I have is that we have we have bought into the notion very subconsciously, I think that, you know, a woman's value is what she looks like and what she does for somebody else. For example, in my case, where it's like, I couldn't do the things that I was normally doing. And of course, then I'm like, I'm also in the middle of menopause dealing with all the symptoms and definitely not looking like I used to, right. You start to question your value in the world. And like for us to be able to shift where we see that value, that it's not in our bodies, it's not in what we do for anybody else. Our value is us, like us, the knowledge, the wisdom, the experience, and the gifts that we bring to the world. So being able to shift that paradigm of how we think about ourselves, that's probably been one of the most common things that I've seen in all the midlife reinvention stories that I have shared. So mm-hmm. the first step I would say is like just belief that we are more than our, than society tells us we are. Yeah. I'm a healer and I deal with helping people rediscover who they are. So uh, Mm -hmm. I know we, we, we do some similar work, uh, you know, help helping people find themselves. But what I notice is that we're not really in a position when we first come up against this, this conundrum, we're not really in a position to accept that we can change Mm-hmm. who we have been like it's it's mm-hmm. like we we create this persona of who we are and, and our belief about who we think we are and and how yeah. others see us uh, but the idea of being somebody else or changing that is is sometimes not even in people's minds do you notice that too oh 100 um 
one of the things that I, uh, I will say is, you know, every chapter demands a different version of you. So everything that worked for us to get us to where we are now is not the same thing that's going to work for us moving forward. And often our lives are showing that to us very, very clearly. Like in my case, it was like, okay, I'm no longer married. I no longer have a career, you know, I mean, I still have a kid, but um, it was like, okay, if I want my life to be different, then I have to show up differently in it. I can't sh keep showing up as the same person and expect something different. So that was for me, was like, okay, I'm the commonality in all of these things that are being reflected back to me in my life. So I have to start taking a look at who I am and how I show up. And, you know, for me, I was the very ambitious, you know, corporate executive. I was the person in the gym at, you know, 5 a.m., in the office by 7, like traveling all the time, doing all the things. Like my life was so busy. And I recognize now that that business was actually a distract distraction from some of the stuff that I really needed to see that I didn't want to see, right? Like mm -hmm. the not enoughness, like all of my achievements in life were like, look, world, look, here I am good. And I actually had to get to the point where, all of that was taken away from me to be able to see myself for who I actually was and the value that I bring as just being me existing on this planet without doing anything. And it's like, if I will be honest, it's still a work in progress today, mm -hmm. right? Like to learn yeah. how to be and not do, because I can get sucked onto the doing train really easy if I take my eye off the ball, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You so you hear me, <laughs> right? Like it's so yeah. easy. And I'll find myself sometimes back in that place and I'll be like, whoa, sister, where are you going? back up, back it up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So with the podcast that you're doing, are you finding that you're getting people's responses to this new, I, I call it new information because it, there's more and more of it these days, but uh, there wasn't very much information out there for us to base this, this new way of being or the possibility of a new way of being in the world. Uh, with with your podcast, are you finding that it's helping people? Have have you had any response to it? Yeah, um, I am actually, I think, shocked on a weekly basis by the responses that I get from women. You know, mainly I cover women's reinvention stories, but I also cover topics from experts who are have important information for us on this rediscovery journey. And sometimes I think things that may or may not resonate. There are women that will email me and say, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I needed to hear right now. Like uh, this, this message was meant for me. And, you know, I go into every podcast episode, just trusting that whatever, wherever my curiosity is that there's somebody else out there who has the same questions. And so that's kind of what I lead with. And, um, Things that I think are well-known pieces of information or who have become that have become well-known pieces of information for me as I've been, you know, doing this podcast now for the last two years and doing the work that I do in the world now for the last like almost five years. There are still so many women who are, like I said, who just are like eating this up. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, like this literally changed how I thought about this situation, or I didn't realize this was possible, or thank you for showing me that example. So as much as I think we see the tides turning in terms of how midlife women are portrayed, there's still a bit of a disconnect. Because if I look at, um, for example, you see more midlife women, gray-haired women in mainstream media. But most of those women are genetically gifted, right? <laughs> like they have beautiful skin, perfectly thin bodies. You know, the, their, the shade of their gray hair is the exact perfect shade for their complexion. And I still think there's a bit of a relatability issue there, right? Like there's still kind of a distance between me as the average middle-aged woman and that woman that's out there. You know, like I think of uh, Mae Musk. Is that her name? Um, yeah, anyway, she's become like a very, very famous model, you know, representing women in their 50s and 60s. But I'm like, wow, 99.9% .9 of the women on the planet don't look like you. So, you know, I think there is so much power in us all sharing our story that like it's something that we just need to keep on doing. Because every time I share my story or you share your story or somebody else, somebody takes something somewhere from it. And we like raise, we raise us all up in the process of it. Yeah, it is interesting because I 
did listen to one of your podcasts and it's something that I talk about a lot is that the three stages of life, the maiden mm-hmm. mother crone, the, the maiden being when we first come out into the world and, you know, everything is springtime and, and flowers and, you know, motherhood. Well, we celebrate motherhood um, all the time. And then the next stage we're given is the crone. And mm-hmm. most people think of the crone as an ugly old woman. You know, I don't understand. I mean, I'm I'm in my mid fifties now, and I don't correspond to either of those archetypes. Yeah. And yeah. so that has been, I think, the problem. And I think part of it is the fact that women in the past didn't live uh, as long as they do today. Yeah. So there wasn't really a lot of life um, it left in them. But there's mm-hmm. loads of life left in us. And I didn't see myself in either of those categories. So, you know, I, I, I presume you felt the same way. Yeah, I've actually retermed that stage between <laughs> motherhood and crone as the maven years, because first of all, it's the longest chapter of our lives, like between the ages of like 50 or 40 and 80, right? Like there's no other chapter that's that long. Yeah. And, you know, if you look up the definition of the word maven, it means an expert with knowledge and wisdom to share. And that for me was the perfect characterization of this time of our lives. So we are young enough to make the changes. We, you know, like we're old enough to know what changes we want to make and to affect those changes. And we're young enough Mm -hmm. to see them happen in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much power in that, that like, how could we ignore this part of our lives? And we really have like, you know, it's, it's really sad to see the representation of women, you know, ending up motherhood and then beginning, you know, as a wizened old crawl sitting, it's crone sitting on a mountain top when there's 30 years or more of life in between. Like, so where are these women? What are they doing? That's what I wanted to share on the podcast was who are they? So, so would you see the maven as the middle between motherhood and crone? Do you see that as a, a middle piece? Yeah. In my mind, it goes maiden, mother, maven, crone. I see. Yeah. I run Red Tent Ontario. So I've been doing a lot of research on women and women's issues. And I call her the wise woman. I call it the wise woman years. So it's really the same thing, right? Exactly. Right. And I think, you know, the part about maven too, is that I loved about that definition when I read it was the part about sharing, you know, knowledge and wisdom with the world, like an expert with knowledge and wisdom to share, because that's like a huge part of the legacy that we're going to leave, right? Is like, you know, first of all, as midlife women, we are the first generation of women to have like held full-time careers, motherhood, you know, and like, it's not the same as our grandmother's or our great grandmothers, or even our mothers, like it's just the the landscape has changed. And unfortunately, we as a society haven't caught up with that yet. And so we are like the leading generation of showing our daughters and their daughters, like what it means to be a 50 year old woman. Right. So I think it's just Mm -hmm. such an incredible opportunity as we step into our power and just really own who we are to relieve a lasting legacy on this planet. Right. To help shift the paradigm of midlife. Exactly. And the thing is, because it hasn't been defined for us. So there really is no definition of, of what, you know, 50 to say 60 looks like, you know, even just the 10 years, like that's not motherhood and it's not cronehood. Uh, But as far as what we're able to create, we are in the creative stages, aren't we? And I really think that that is also what menopause is all about. I I believe menopause, when women bleed each month, they lose their wisdom each month. And when they hit menopause and they're not bleeding it, they keep their wisdom within them. And so I find that as a time that we are so creative because we've got all of that creativity still inside of us. And that's the way I see it is that this time of our life is about creating who we want to be going forward. That's oh, that's when ooh. that's when we get stuck though, isn't it? Because I remember listening to when you were talking about wanting to reinvent yourself, but then there's like this big empty space, like, well, who am I? Where do I want to go? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's for me, you know, like I was in this place where the life that I had been living was just like no longer available to me. And so as I was like, okay, who do I want to be moving forward? And then it was like looking into this big, deep abyss. And there was just like nothing there. 
like nothing was coming back to me. And that's when I started to actually feel like a little like stuck, hopeless. It's like, how do I even move forward when all I'm like, I'm just basically jumping into a big black hole here. Um, And you just alluded to this. It's like the more I retreated inwards to discover myself, the shallower the abyss got right? Like I could actually see the path through the abyss now, but it wasn't like my original plan was, okay, I'm going to steam through this thing and find the thing on the other side and make it. Okay. That worked for me before it no longer was available to me now. And every time I tried, I would end up being like, okay, what do I do? Just jump in and pray like something's going to happen. Like, what do I do? And the more I retreated inwards, the more I worked on finding myself, the more I worked on understanding myself, like the path across the abyss literally revealed itself. Yeah, that's the other part is like knowing, getting to know ourselves enough that we trust ourselves. I'm just going to take a step and then the next step is going to appear before me, right? You know, and trusting that whole process rather than make a plan and plow through like we always have done, right? Yeah, yeah, that that worked in the past, but you're right, it doesn't. Right. But that's yeah. the part that I find most most people that I talk to is that going within peace like let's unpack that a little bit so what do you mean by going within so for me um so the first part was really just understanding who I am like without being told from my job and being a mom and being a wife and without being told who I am like who am I right so that was the first part of just like understanding who I am and what I want the second part for me was really getting to know what I call my soul self or my higher self or um, those intuitive nudges that I had. So all the, when I think back to, for example, being in my career, I would be, for example, I'd be sitting in a boardroom and I'd be thinking to myself, is this it? Is this like, is this what I work so hard for? Is this like the place? Like I have, I got here and like questioning it, knowing that like, okay, there had to be something more. But as soon as that thought would come up, I would immediately push it away by like, okay, get back to work. You've got a job to do. Because I had invested so much to get to that place. Like I had reached the place that I had been trying to get to my entire life, right? Mm-hmm. And then, but knowing that there was more, but every time that would come up, I would push it away. Because if I happened, to, if I had to acknowledge that there was something more, it meant that I had to change something. I had to do something differently. And that what to me was like, uh, what you talking about? Like, what do I, what do I do? So really kind of tuning in to the intuitive part of me, to the deep inner knowing inside myself that first of all, yes, there is something more for you. You're being guided there and be like the, what is it? Like old chicks, no shit came from inside of me, right? Like it literally was just for me, old chicks, no shit was the reminder to myself that like, I know some stuff, right? Like I'm not being, I can't be discounted. Like there's power, there's knowledge, there's wisdom, right? And so that's where it came to me. And then I just like, just kept pulling the threads of that and following the intuitive nudges. It was like, oh, okay, I'm going to write a blog. And I remember like the first time I wrote a blog, I hit publish and then I had to sit on my hands for three days to prevent myself from deleting it. Cause I was like, what are you doing? Right? <laughs> yeah. I didn't really understand it, but I was like, okay, we're just going to go with this. And that literally was the process of, and that's what I call about really getting to know yourself is really getting to know yourself. Like the deepest inner nudges, the deepest intuitive part of you, the wise woman that exists inside you get to know her because she has all of the answers that you were looking for. How do you um, advise people ways that they can get to know themselves? Like, is there a process that you took? How did you get to know yourself? Um, You know, I think the process is different for different people, but the elements of it are the same. How you put them together might look differently. Um, So the first thing, like, for example, you know, those like little nudges or those little voices that are inside you that you immediately push away, you tell them they're wrong, or you have instantly 15 reasons why that thing can't be what it is. And you just push it away. The first step that you do is actually take that thing and write it down somewhere. Give it a tiny little bit of space. Even if you write it down and then forget about it. It's just honoring and acknowledging those parts of yourself. Because here's the thing. If you think about getting to know your intuitive self as any other relationship, if somebody came to talk to you all the time and you said, shut up and go away, eventually they stop showing up. 
Or if you were like, uh, no, you were 100% wrong and told them they were wrong all the time, that person wouldn't trust you, right? And so it's about building that, like, that trust and that knowing. And that requires giving it a little bit of space, even if you aren't really fully ready to acknowledge this whole thing that's coming to you is just write it down, open a, a journal, write it down, and then close the journal and give it a little bit of space. The next time it comes to you, open the journal and write something else about it, or it could be the same thing, but you're literally just creating space for it to exist. Or sometimes I say, say it out loud. It's an acknowledgement. Yeah and an honoring of what's coming up inside me. And then eventually over time, like as you start acknowledging it, it starts to feel a little bit less scary. You start to see a little bit more possibility in it. And over time, you build this relationship where you're like, oh, eh, I kind of like where you're going with this, right? And then you, you can start moving forward. But it's there's no like one miracle answer. I think it's about however you do that, making the time to be with that thing that's coming up for you. Like whatever it is. And like, so for me, another big one is if I am um, walking in nature, right? Like that's where like all kinds of stuff will come to me when I'm just out there walking, yeah. right? So whatever that looks like for you, that you can feel really grounded in yourself, that you can, you know, find a way to be able to create a little, even just a tiny little bit of space to acknowledge that thing that's coming up for you. Yeah, I love that because, you know, we are in our, earlier years we are driven like uh, I I really noticed that in my life it's all about accomplishment it's all about getting somewhere going somewhere and then when I hit 50 I started to see myself in a slightly different way just because I think there is something that biologically happens to us when we hit 50 Uh, I believe that we kind of start Mm -hmm. again at that point but you know, allowing things to be different, I think is probably the biggest message that I hear you saying, and that I say as well, is that, you know, we are not the same person that we were 10 years ago, five years ago, we we are totally evolving all the time, right? But unless we give ourselves some space for something to move into, we will never notice or find or create this new person that we are wanting to become. We've got the urges, we've got the thoughts, those those little thoughts that come to us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, creating that space. So I often say do it in meditation and meditation mm-hmm. isn't necessarily just following through on somebody's guided meditation or just um, sitting on the mountain. It's just being still and letting something come in. And again, that's part of making space, isn't it? Yeah, it, re- it really is. Um, because we are, I think, again, as a culture, we are taught to f- fill every minute with something, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's very little downtime and we're processing more information than we've ever processed ever before in life. And so there's literally no space for the things. And even, you know, sometimes I say like, just turn off the TV, like, or take 15 minutes of time that you would be watching TV and just like sit on the couch. Just see what's <laughs> yeah. up. Like, yeah. and depending upon where people are in their journey, like sometimes meditation, meditation is not available to yeah. some people, you know, and I'll tell you a story like meditation w- wasn't uh, available to me. I would lie there going, what the hell? I could be doing this. I could be doing that. Right. Like, so <laughs> yeah. and I had tried it a couple times before, but like, I remember, you know, in that year that was kind of leading up to everything in my life unraveling, I was on a business trip. In fact, I was in New York city and I knew that there was a meditation class happening at this yoga studio because I was attempting yoga to try and figure out, okay. And I was felt so compelled to go to this meditation class. So I actually took an earlier standby flight home to make sure that I made it to this meditation class. Walked into the class. It was a guided meditation. I sit there and all of a sudden I start to feel all of this emotion like welling up inside me. And I'm like, what's happening? Like, what's going on? Like, I'm losing it, right? To the point that like, and I'm trying to stuff it down. It got to the point where I literally couldn't and it all erupted. And I sat there for the 90 minute yoga class, basically sobbing, like just crying. I had no idea why I was crying. And, you know, the the meditation teacher, she just gave me a big box of Kleenex and sat there and everybody's, you know, talking about how beautiful their meditation experience was. I couldn't even speak. Like I was just like hair running down my face. I walk out of the class with like a mitt full of snotty Kleenex. <laughs> Like she just kept nodding and smiling at me the whole time. And as I'm leaving the class, she says to me, oh, I'm doing an eight week series if you'd like to sign up. And before I knew what I was doing, I signed up. And every week for eight weeks, I went into that class and I sat on that mat and I cried for eight weeks. And it was literally 
this uncorking of all of this stuff that I had just like stuffed down into my body, all of the emotions that I had covered up with being busy or had something to do. Everything that I had ignored literally just came up and out. And it was like out of my control. I mean, I see it now for what it was. It was absolutely necessary yeah. for it to happen because there was no space. And so my body decided without me that it was going to create the space that I needed to be able to go on this journey, which God bless my body. Like, <laughs> yeah. like now I look at it as, you know, being like divine intervention or whatever it is, but it, I, that had to happen for me to uncork the stuff and make the space. It was the beginning of me stepping into the new version of me that I needed to be for this next part of my journey. Yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful story and, and a really good visual as well. I, I could just see you there with your tissues in your hands. But <laughs> but but that's what I'm finding as, as a healer. That's why clients are coming to me is to relieve that pressure of basically their entire lives and, and all of the things that have that have started to become so heavy that they're dragging it around with them rather than being light and hopeful and positive in the world. They're dragging around this weight of you know, all the restrictions that they've experienced and all of the hardships that they've gone through and all of these stories yeah. are like heavy on their shoulders. So I think what you've mentioned there, it, it really does hit the nail on the head is that we cannot create something new if there is no space for it. And so we have to create space. So getting rid of the baggage, getting rid of these things that are taking you away from shining your light in the world. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, you know, even your jobs as a, a wife and as an employee and all of those kinds of things, that's just another way that obviously life was making some space for you. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> You know, and there's, you know, there is a beautiful analogy from uh, Chinese medicine where it talks about, and this is the, and you just alluded to this, the importance of menopause, um, you know, signaling a shift in the way that we show up in the world where in Chinese medicine, there's the energy meridian that runs through your body. And during your reproductive years, the Chong meridian energy runs downwards, like towards your reproductive organs, because that's kind of the focus of what's, what's, what's happening in your life. And then when you reach menopause, the energy actually reverses and comes up through your body and out through your eyes. And with the notion that it's how you share your gifts with the world. I'm like, when I first read that, I was like goosebumps all over because that, <laughs> yeah. exactly, that was a, that exactly was the perfect articulation, you know, and this is like an ancient, ancient Chinese medicine, you know, and I'm not a, I am not a Chinese medicine practitioner by any means, but that analogy just stuck with me because it like, there's a physical shift happening within us yeah. and we're being asked to step into the new version changing direction so that a woman can share her gifts with the world. I'm like, how beautiful is that? But it's the perfect analogy. Yeah, it right? is. And, and it's the message that I think we're both trying to get out there is that we have so much to share. We mm -hmm. have experience, we have a whole lifetime of experiences, but we also have the wisdom aspect. And, yeah. and I think that is the one thing that if we were to create this new um, archetype between mother and crone. So whether we call it maven, whether we call it wise woman, you know, that archetype is something that, you know, maybe by talking about it so much, it will create itself. But if you were to, to describe that archetype or that, that woman at that stage of life, what kind of words would you use? Mm, great question. I would use words like strength, bravery, wisdom, confidence, like a new confidence, like not, co not confidence based on anything outside of her, but like a deep inner confidence. Um, she's intuitive. Um, you know, she's driven from the inside as opposed to what's happening in the external world. She, you know, she knows her gifts and she's not afraid to share them. Like she steps boldly forward um, into like whatever it is and knows her place in that right? Like she's not hanging back. She's not waiting. She's just stepping, stepping forward based on what she knows to be true. And, and she's changing the world by doing that, right? Like she might not see it. 
She might not see it in everything that she does, but as she walks her way, and I have this, as I'm talking, I'm like having this vision of like this woman who's just kind of walking along this path. And as she's walking this path, it's just opening up in front of her. Right. And it's like, you know, green and lush and beautiful. And with each step she takes, she doesn't realize that every step she takes, she's making a difference in the world. That's beautiful. I I could just picture that too, you know, and it's, and it feels so positive and it feels so right. You know, Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like something contrived. It doesn't feel like we're trying to prove something to the world. And I think that's part of the biggest difference, isn't it? We're doing it for ourselves, not for somebody else. Yeah. Up to this point in our lives doing for everybody else. And now this is the time where all of our energy, we start pulling it back from all of those people, places, and situations. We start pulling it back to ourselves. And all of that energy now goes into acknowledging ourselves and to creating whatever it is that we want to create in the world. Exactly. And so for yourself, as we kind of come to a close, what is it that you want to create in your life going Mm -hmm. forward? I am on a big mission. Um, (laughs) I am so personally, like for me personally, and then I'll talk about my mission, like for me personally, it's becoming a lot deeper in my spiritual practice, a lot deeper in my intuitive knowings, like just really settling into myself. And maybe there are parts of myself that I had disowned along the way that just didn't fit whatever narrative was given to me. I'm really claiming back all of those parts of myself right? And then looking at them in a new light. Um, And it's been interesting, an interesting journey as I discover myself and start pulling back those pieces, pieces that I thought before were like broken or unusable or to this or to that. Now I look at them and I'm looking at them in a completely different light. And I like, I see the whole picture now of who I am, which, you know, for some people, you know, for some women, you know, they knew who they were, then they lost it, then they refound it, they reclaimed it. For me, and there's many women like me, I never really understood all of me, right? And now it's like meeting parts of myself for the very first time, and like learning to love all those pieces. So like, for me personally, that's it. And then what I am most passionate about is just women stepping into their power, And just really, first of all, owning who they are, but like creating whatever it is that they want to create, like following their dreams and their desires. When I hear from my clients in my workshops or even on the podcast, when I hear the dreams and desires that these women have for the world, they are so incredible. Like I end up in tears more often than not, like (laughs) listening to these, the visions of these women, because they're just so incredible. And I'm like, the world needs this. It can't stay inside you. Like if you put that thing into the world, you are going to change lives. You are going to change people. And so really just empowering women to see themselves beyond, you know, their bodies and what they do for other people and see themselves, just like you said, as creative beings able to bring whatever it is they want into the world. That for me is, yeah, is my mission. (laughs) Wow. So old chicks know shit. They they certainly do. (laughs) And that is your mission is so that women realize that they do know a lot and that they have their dreams and they have the desires. I tell people the reason that you have these thoughts is because they are possible. So whatever you're dreaming of is possible simply because you thought it. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like the dreams and desires that you have are not random. They're given to you because you have everything it takes to make that a reality. What's also really beautiful is that everything leading up to this point in your life has prepared you for where you want to go next. So if all of a sudden you have a dream or desire that are, that erupts for you at age 45 or 50, your life has literally led you to that point. And when you start unpacking all of the life that you've lived before that, you will see that you have all of the ingredients you need to go to that next thing it's so powerful. Like it's literally changing the world. People can uh, see other women doing it. And that's what I think both of our podcasts is about. If we see people doing it, then we can start to believe that, Hey, maybe I can do it too. Yeah. Well, if it's possible for me, it's absolutely possible for anybody. Wise, wise advice. And thank you. Thank you, Maven, for sharing your wise (laughs) advice today. (laughs) Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. 
Thanks for listening. And did you know that positive reviews from listeners like you help me get these messages out into the world? Leave a rating for Own the Grey on your podcast app or at ownthegrey.ca. This episode of Own the Grey is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses.